Can I now introduce Professor Tom Burke, the chairman of E3G, Third Generation Environmentalism, a visiting professor at both Imperial and University Colleges London, and he's also a senior associate at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. Thank you. That was, that was quite enough. I was um, reading uh, the paper this morning, and there was an article about a rather fashionable, at least discuss, much discussed topic of fake news. And I was also thinking about what I might say today. And I, I connected those two bits by realizing that one of the um, earliest bits of fake news I can recall was the notion that you could have atoms for peace. You can't have atoms for peace without having atoms for war. It's the same technology, it's the same skills, it's the same experience. But somehow we've managed to delude ourselves for an extraordinarily long period of time that it's possible to have atoms for peace without them also being available for war. Anyway, that was the sort of connection I made as I was thinking about what I might say this afternoon. And I was asked to talk about British energy policy. Turned out to be quite a difficult thing to, to talk about. Um, there is a very broad national consensus on what we want our energy policy to do, what the goal of British energy policy should be. It should be affordable, it should be secure, and it should deliver and be low carbon in delivering the services that people want. There is a really, I don't know anybody who doesn't think that so-called trilemma is what we are all trying uh, to do. And there is no doubt at all that that can be delivered in the UK uh, in a way that does not involve nuclear power. And what's more, were we to do that, it would be cheaper and more secure than trying to do it in the way we're currently doing it. We don't have a problem with technology. We have actually more technology than we can really begin to use. And we certainly don't have a problem with the economics of using low carbon technologies or a variety of low carbon technologies all of the problems about getting to the goal are political problems. They're problems about getting the politics right, not about getting the, the technologies or the economics right. And as we look at that project in the context of what's going on in the world, as we look around what's happening in the world, it's very clear that all over the world we're now engaged in a uh, transition, in the so-called energy transition as we move to a low carbon economy in order to make sure that climate change doesn't destroy uh, civilization. And as we do that, by the way, as we're listening to Chris uh, Ball uh, this morning, if, as we make that transition, we must ensure that it's a just transition. It's not just a shift of technology, it's also a shift of people's livelihoods, of, people, of communities, and we must take those livelihoods and those communities with us as we make that transition. Um, as you look at that and you look at Britain against that background, we're getting left behind because we have failed. And I say this is not a partisan point. We have failed across the governing parties in this country to put together a policy that would facilitate that transition, would enable that uh, transition. You look at what the world is going to spend on energy over the next uh, 25 or so years, it's going to spend about 10 uh, uh, trillion dollars on doing that. About three quarters of that are on renewables. We are getting well left well behind on that transition the rest of the world is getting out with. Now, very important for climate change, very important for energy costs and security and so on. But there's a, another benefit of making that transition that we don't pay enough, anything like as much attention to. As we make a transition to that world that is more electricity dependent and that uses renewables energy efficiency as its primary sources of creating the secure supply that people want. We will also eliminate air pollution that costs the National Health Service about $15 billion a year. So we won't only be saving the planet, we'll also be saving the National Health Service. So I was asked in the title, I think it says in the programme, to think about the changes in the non-existent. It's very hard to describe changes in a policy that doesn't really exist. Um, 
But we've seen lots of bits, lots of things done by government uh, that have come under the heading of um, uh, energy policy. And frankly, the only way to describe that sequence of changes, whether it's on renewables, whether it's on energy efficiency, wherever you look, it's one that's uh, arbitrary and incoherent. And so I'm not going to discuss the changes that British government has made uh, anymore. Let me just illustrate a bit the kind of chaos that you've, we're seeing in energy policy. Ed Miliband, under a considerable amount of pressure, came up with an idea that you should cap people's bills. The Conservative Party robustly accused him of introducing a Marxist policy uh, which was completely uh, unacceptable and promptly put it into the manifesto they've just not quite won the election on. Uh, now, how, how can you, when you have that kind of incoherence, that was across two years, how can you expect investors or consumers to have any confidence that you know what you're doing? And actually, by the way, um, if you look at the numbers, the reason that energy uh, bills went up the political agenda was marginally to do with rising costs of gas and electricity, a little bit more to do with a bit of manipulation by the uh, utilities, but an enormous amount to do with the fact that real incomes were falling throughout that period. And you can see the logic very clearly. Uh, nobody's talked about you know, doing something about real incomes as a way of dealing with the prom political prominence of energy bills. You see the same kind of incoherence and you've got a government that says we really believe in local people having some say over their energy policy and so we will only allow you to uh, build onshore wind farms, the cheapest form of renewables, if the local community just support it. But if the local community does not want fracking, here's a whole list of things and they're all detailed in the Conservative Party manifesto, here's a whole list of things we will do to make sure that local people don't have any say in whether fracking goes ahead. Now, now, why would you, if you're an investor, why would you think that there was a government that was going to deliver you some kind of politically stable context in which your investment can deliver? But the most, the most profound incoherences are in the nuclear government's commitment, and it's a cross-party commitment to nuclear power. Uh, it's not a... a there is no national consensus, by the way. One of the illusions that I think our politicians have got into recently is thinking if you have a cross-party consensus, you have a national consensus. It's not true uh, anymore, if it ever were. But let's look at what nuclear has... Nuclear power has persuaded... They're so enthralled, uh, our politicians, to nuclear power. It's persuaded a Conservative government to set up a state purchasing agency to buy our electricity a Soviet-style body, which not only decides how much electricity the nation needs, but decides what sources will be used to generate that electricity and how much the nation will pay to make it available. Now, how can that be something that a conservative, a, a, a principled conservative, believes in? And Hinkley Point? Well, the only way Hinkley Point is ever going to get built is if... A, if, if we fulfill the terms of a contract we've signed, a take or pay contract that we have signed, a conservative government, sorry, not we, not us, a conservative government has signed a take or pay contract to buy the electricity for 35 years from Hinkley Point at, at three times, more or less, the current wholesale price of electricity. Now, Leave aside the fact that why would any conservator ever lose so much confidence in markets that you think you ought to buy anything 35 years ahead, let alone electricity. But let's just, just look at what that means for a future energy minister. If you just take the low, National Grid's low penetration of uh, renewables, then by the time Hinkley is producing electricity at three times the current wholesale price, which we have to take because we've already bought it, Renewables will be offering uh, electricity to the grid uh, for um, probably between April and October for all of the power we need, electricity we need in that period. What that means is we'll be having to pay renewable generators to turn off their generators in order to take much more expensive electricity that we've already bought from Hinkley. So we'll be paying twice 
in effect for the same electricity and we'll end up with electricity much more expensive than we could have, have bought it. Now I just lay those things out to give you an example, and I could go on and on, of the kind of chaos, the non-policy that successive governments in this country have been producing. Why have they done that? I mean, please tell me if you can, I don't know. I mean, I can look at some of the reasons. Bad ideas are some of the reasons. So the idea that you need baseload, uh, the idea all of the above, or what uh, Chris Ball referred to this morning as uh, uh, a balance across electricity supply, uh, the power of the lobbies, the um, situation that Andrew described about the uh, previous Labour government having got it right and then suddenly, well it was Mr Blair uh, changed its mind, may or may not have had something to do with the fact that EDF's then uh, head of government affairs were Gordon Brown's brother. Perhaps not. Uh, we have a lot of politicians who are pretty ignorant about uh, energy policy. And anyway, they're much more interested in what the headlines say than they are in what the policy outcomes actually are. And we have, frankly, a malevolent right-wing press that has promised us year after year after year that the lights were about to go out, even though the the man who ran, runs, used to run uh, the national grid, has stood up year after year and said they're not going to go out. Now he was somebody who lost his job, if they did go out, uh, right away. We saw just how bad that sort of malevolent corruption of the role of the President Democratic Society would be, again, just the day before yesterday, when the Daily Mail, you know, can find the depths of any gutter you, you put low there uh, when it's running normally. The day before yesterday, it found a, a sewer buried deep when it said that the reason why that awful thing happened at Grenfell Tower was because of green energy policies. That, that was what the Daily Mail said. Editorial, Editorial said. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's part of the reason why we have such a mess. The result is a lot of the time we're asking the wrong question. We're asking a question in energy policy about what technologies should we be choosing when we should increasingly be asking a question about what's the kind of system that will deliver the services people need most efficiently. And that's the kind of things that you're, that there's now, frankly, outside government more knowledge than there is inside government based on energy efficiency, the kind of things that uh, Andrew was talking about, the renewables, whose costs are going on, going down, while nuclear costs continue to go up, demand management, the ability increasingly to manage the way we use our electricity more efficiently, increases productivity, uh, use of uh, interconnectors so we're connected up to other markets. All of those things, all of those things which are now presenting us with the most wonderfully politically enticing prospect you could possibly imagine. And that's the prospect of offering voters an energy system in which you won't only get a bill through your door, but if we do it right, you'll get a check as well as you become a consumer and you part in a renewables dependent uh, economy, you can play a part in generating as well as purchasing electricity. I can't for the life of me see what's wrong with our politicians that they don't get the, the extraordinary attractiveness to voters of that proposition. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for that uh, stirring and, and deeply uh, informative discussion.